you know, we filmed a, we filmed a series of vignettes and chapters on, uh, in gun tech that we called the nearly perfect safari rifle. And fairly regularly I'll be asked, uh, where did that idea come from? Where did the idea of the nearly perfect safari rifle come from? And I guess anybody that's hunted Africa uh, very many times is, you know, you have a favorite gun and what's your favorite gun this year? What was your favorite gun last year? What are you hunting? And, and somewhere along the line, this is my favorite gun or if I could do something with it, I would do this with it. Um, a lot of time riding in a safari car and um, a lot of time tracking elephant and buffalo and stuff like that. And somewhere along the, Id the line, the idea came up of, well, why don't we build a nearly perfect safari rifle? So I think that's, that's where the idea of the nearly perfect safari rifle came from was just that, that love of guns and, and hunting and thinking and tracking and riding and, and let's call it the nearly perfect safari rifle. But when you think about, so what is a nearly perfect safari rifle? Uh, what, what are the components of it? What, what do you want? Um, for me, I guess it starts with, a, with appearance. So what, what would you reasonably expect your nearly perfect safari rifle to look like? And it, it needs to look the way you want it to look. It needs to look nearly perfect. And that's gonna be the wood or, or uh, fiberglass stock. It's gonna be whether it's blue or stainless steel. It's gonna be what kind of scope you got on it, uh, sights. It's, what does it look like? You know, before you ever pick it up, does it look like a nearly perfect safari rifle? I think that's where it all starts. And now you're going to, now you're going to have it in your hand and you're going to, you're not just looking at it, now you're, you're kind of studying it and you're thinking about how it's going to work. And in, in, in gunology, we talk about lock, stock, and barrel. And lock, stock, and barrel is, well, you know, it's the action. Uh, that would be the lock. Uh, the stock, of course, we know what that is, and the barrel. So when you've got it in your hand, then you can literally begin to think about lock, stock, and barrel. Um, gee, the, the concept of the lock, it, what, what kind of an action do you want on a nearly perfect safari rifle? And as I was thinking about it, I thought, well, uh, everybody talks about control round feed. They want a Winchester Model 70 or they want a Mauser um, uh, or one of the modern reproductions of those. And so they think control round feed, but I, I look in the vault and, and my vault is, it's got lots and lots and lots of Remington guns in it. So it's the Remington action that I'm familiar with, whether I'm shooting varmints or, or deer hunting or elk hunting or whatever, I'm most likely gonna have a Remington rifle in my hand. Okay, so you got a Remington rifle in your hand now and what are you gonna take to Africa? Something other than a Remington rifle? I don't think so. So for me at least, the nearly perfect safari rifle uh, it comes out of the vault. It's whatever you've got in the vault, that's what you're going to take to Africa because you really need to be familiar with that gun because Africa can be dangerous. One of the things that most folks don't understand have never been in Africa is how much, how much time you have on your hands. Um, you're riding around in a safari car, um, you're hanging around doing nothing much at lunch, maybe you're reading or smoking a cigar, um, uh, you're, you're at camp, you're having dinner, you're having lunch, whatever you're doing, but there's lots and lots of time in Africa to think. Um, so here I am and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'm gonna carry this gun. Uh, back then I still carried uh, my own rifle. Uh, but you're gonna carry this gun, so weight must be important to you. Uh, if you want uh, a big caliber gun, you're probably gonna want a heavier gun because you don't want the recoil but you still have to carry it. So you have to have that balance between recoil and carry. Um, and you have to think about the caliber you want. What are you gonna hunt? How big of a gun do you need? So uh, the, the caliber was a very, very important choice because caliber and weight kind of go together. Um, and then the balance that you're looking for. Uh, and then another thing uh, in today's uh, safari, I typically only take one gun. I take one rifle. Uh, and therefore I'm gonna shoot everything with it. Now, I'm mostly a dangerous game hunter today, so I'm hunting lion, uh, leopard, uh, elephant, buffalo, uh, and some plains game for camp or whatever. 
but I need a dangerous game gun. Uh, can you find a caliber, uh, and we did, 375 H and H, that is good for both the dangerous game and you can also shoot the, the planes game with it. So I'm using a scope that is really a low power variable scope, if you would, but it allows me to shoot. I've shot out to 325 yards with a five power scope, and I've shot at 15 yards with a, with a five power scope on one power. So uh, having that flexibility of caliber and the flexibility of scope uh, and having a weight that you're not afraid to carry or not uncomfortable carrying for hours and hours and hours on a buffalo track or an elephant track, uh, all that is part of what goes into the concept of, of nearly perfect. This is, uh, this is a, really the early prototype for the nearly perfect safari rifle. So this gun I was, I was using and we'd built to this point before we ever came up with the concept of nearly perfect. Uh, you'll notice it's got a stainless steel barrel on it and that seemed like the right thing. You're gonna carry the gun over your shoulder a lot, a lot of humidity in Africa. But ultimately I didn't like the, the way the barrel scuffed up here. This was lightly bead blasted and you really had to clean it up every time you came back because it really just looked terrible. So it didn't really please my eye, the stainless steel barrel didn't. Uh, we've got a little bit more red tint in the stock. This is English walnut stock, but a little bit more red tint in it uh, than what I really like. Uh, you'll notice that we don't yet have the three position safety uh, on the bolt shroud here. Uh, that's something that came in the nearly perfect gun. And the trigger on this gun is just, uh, it'll be nickel plated, uh, but uh, the nearly perfect rifle has got a, a gold appearance trigger. It's titanium nitride. Uh, so, but from an appearance standpoint, uh, this is the basis of the nearly perfect safari rifle, uh, designed to fit me very well. I uh, got the scope on it that I would ultimately decide was the nearly perfect scope. Uh, uh, and it very, looks very nice. It's pretty much the weight that I'd like to, uh, got all the features that I'd like to have. So this is the, this is the, the prototype or the basis of the nearly perfect safari rifle here. For me, the appearance of a gun is the very first thing I notice. So whether it's laying on a table or in a rack, uh, appearance comes first. Do you like the way it looks? Uh, I think in life it works that way uh, also. You first see a car or you see a pretty girl uh, and you like the way it looks and uh, that uh, maybe causes, uh, causes you to, uh, to go to the next step. Uh, so if you look at this safari rifle and you think, okay, how does it look? Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here that, that comes into my head. Uh, first of all, it's, it's got a wood stock on it and it's got blued steel uh, metal. Uh, this is slow rust bluing on the metal. But that's the first thing that I notice is what does the stock look like and what does the metal look like, the wood and the metal. Um, then it's kind of a matter of, well, a safari rifle, a nearly perfect safari rifle ought to have express sights on it, uh, as you see here. Uh, that pleases my eye to see them. I don't use them a lot. Uh, we've got a barrel band front swivel. Rather than putting the front swivel here on the stock, we've got it up on the barrel band. Uh, I really, frankly, don't use a, a sling in Africa. I carry the gun over my shoulder if I'm going to be carrying it. Uh, so I don't really have a sling there. Uh, but if I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be hunting Alaska, and I've hunted up there a couple of times uh, uh, with this gun or with the prototype to it uh, for a, a brown bear. Um, and in those cases, of course, I'm always going to have a sling over my shoulder or have the gun slung over my shoulder. Um, and of course, this, uh, the rear swivel then is a, it's a two position or uh, it's a two screw swivel. So you never have to worry about the screw, the swivel turning and getting loose. Um, I'm, I'm a fan of ebony four end tip and this particular, <laughs> this piece of ebony, I actually brought back from Africa. So we cut an old dead tree over there and brought a piece of it back, uh, to make this swivel with. Uh, we've got a grip cap on it, uh, pretty neat little thing here, the, uh, uh, the magnum cross bolts in it here that are going to uh, keep the stock from splitting. It's ebony uh, inlaid into a little brass uh, cup, if you would, so you can see the brass, you can see the ebony. We pick up the, the, uh, the, the brass color here, if you would, on the, uh, uh, the loophole scope. You've got it down here now around the cross bolts. Uh, the trigger is titanium nitride plated. 
Uh, so you can see that. So you've got some nice colors there, if you would, between the two rings on the scope and the rings around the magnum cross bolts and the trigger. Uh, very attractive. Uh, the jeweling on the, the bolt, that's something that you notice right away. So all these features here are, uh, yes, they're functional. Most of them are, but some of them are just there to please the eye. So this gun to me is very pleasing. Uh, it's got a 24 inch barrel rather than a 22 inch barrel. A uh, 24 inch barrel looks good on a gun like this. A 22 would look a little short and a 26 frankly looks a little long. Um, one thing you'll notice, it really is appearance too. This is, a, this is not a Remington bolt handle. Uh, this we cut off of an old Mauser, so it's a smooth bolt handle and it's perfectly round rather than the oval type checkered uh, bolt handle that's on a Remington. So the whole purpose for this is just to extend it and make it a little bit longer. But at the same time we're doing that, I wanted a bolt handle that was really quite functional. And uh, this one certainly is. So that's the appearance that I look for in a nearly perfect safari rifle. The lock of the gun, um, using old-timey old terms, if you would, is, is the action. It's everything but the barrel and the stock. So lock, stock, and barrel. Everything but the, uh, the barrel and the stock will be the lock. So it really the centerpiece of it is going to be the action. And we've got a Remington 700 action. It's an ADL action. That is, it's a blind magazine action. Uh, because in Africa, I don't ever unload my gun. I load it, and it's that way for the whole safari. Uh, I keep it loaded in camp. Uh, so I never really need to take the cartridges out the bottom. Um, and thus I prefer to also get a little bit more strength in the stock by having the, uh, having the wood along the bottom. Uh, but it is a Remington action and it's a push feed action and not a, not a controlled round feed action. Uh, lots of folks would say, oh, you gotta have a controlled round feed in Africa because it's a dangerous game. But uh, kind of my position is that most of the guns in my vault are Remington 700s. So that's the, the, the action that I have shot and shot and shot on prairie dog fields and hunting white tailed deer and practically everything else. That, that's the one I'm most familiar with and I want to have a gun on dangerous game that I'm very familiar with. So the Remington 700 is, in my opinion, the nearly perfect action for a safari rifle for me, just because that's the gun I use. If you happen to be shooting Seikos or Winchesters or anything else, well, there might be another action that's nearly perfect for you. Now something that you can't see here, but that we did, we what we call blueprinted the action. So we squared the action all up, the, the front of the action with the threads. Uh, we squared up the bolt face uh, with the front of the action. So uh, we lapped in the lugs. This is what you call a blueprinted action. It's take the action, do everything you can uh, to get to make it the very most accurate that it can possibly be. So it's just a matter of fine tuning it and, and getting it down to some very fine tolerances. Then we said, well, we're going to need a great trigger because part of the lock is the trigger system. So this is an aftermarket trigger. Uh, and uh, this is a shelling trigger, and we happen to have the, the, the actual lever itself. Uh, we had them titanium nitride, and that was really for appearance. But this trigger is quite adjustable, uh, and it's very, very fine. That is, the, uh, the tolerance uh, uh, between pulling a trigger one time and three times, um, the way to pull is, is adjusted to what I prefer, uh, which is about three pounds but the difference between one pull and the next and the next is just uh, an ounce or even less than an ounce. So what I'm looking for is a very consistent trigger pull that always goes bang when I'm thinking bang. So the triggers are, is a critical, critical element of the lock. We, uh, probably not necessary on a 375 caliber gun, but we drilled out the scope mounting holes in the, uh, in the top of the action. They were 648 and we retapped them then, we drilled them out and retapped them 840. What we're looking for is a stronger screw uh, than, what, than, than six by 48. So eight by 40 is gonna be a little stronger. Probably not terribly important on a 375, but if your nearly perfect safari rifle was a 416 Remington or 416 Rigby because you wanted a little bit more energy, uh, repeated firings then with that, uh, in those calibers, uh, might put some wear and tear on those, on those rings 
upgrading the screws to 8x40 just, just seemed like the right thing to do. You'll notice that we've got quick detachable, uh, quick detachable mounts on the scope. These are loophole, and this let us take the scope off just at any time we want to and, and use the iron sights. So if you're getting maybe close to dark, if you're hunting dangerous game, if you're in thick bush or something like that and you have to do a follow-up, uh, you, you want to be able to get this scope off quickly. So in my mind, nearly perfect safari rifle would have quick detachable uh, rings on it, and it's these loophole rings that, that I certainly prefer. Uh, the three position safety, a standard Remington would have a, uh, just a push safety right here uh, that would block the trigger, but we have here then a three position safety. Very easy to do, very easy to put off. We can unload it here. It's completely blocked here. So you want a bolt handle that can't come up when the safety's on. And with the three position safety, the bolt can't come up. This is the mid place. It still is on safe, but you can now unload it. And of course, this is fire. So in the field, you're simply gonna go there and bang. Very, very convenient for your thumb to reach. I think that a three position safety, uh, certainly it's my requirement for a, a nearly perfect safari rifle because it is truly a safety, uh, very, very convenient to operate. Now the stock is probably the most complicated part of the entire gun. Uh, I'll tell you maybe there's four parts to it. Uh, first is kind of what you see here. Uh, it needs to be attractive. Uh, you can tell that this is made out of English walnut. Uh, you can see that we've got a sanded end finish on it, uh, that we put the ebony four end tip on it. Um, you maybe can see that we've got a one hammer swell here. I wanted a little bit of a swell to pick up the palm of my hand. Uh, it's a, what we call a round four end, so there's no corners on the four end at all. It's just perfectly round, or, well, nearly perfectly round. Uh, you can see we've got a Packmire decelerator pad on it. It's black. There's no white outlines on it, uh, the two screw swivels here. Uh, so what you see on the stock is, uh, is, is the first thing I would talk about. We've got wraparound checkering here, uh, and this is 20 line per inch checkering that we've done on it. Uh, something pretty simple. Uh, it's a hunting rifle, it's not a, a gun case rifle. Uh, you can see the, uh, the magnum cross bolts. So these are some threaded bolts through there that hold the stock together to keep it from splitting under recoil. So it's a very attractive stock, and that was one of the requirements. Uh, you really can't tell that it fits me perfectly, so that was one of my requirements, is that I wanted it to fit me. So what it feels like here, what it feels like here, the distance from here to here so that it fits my hand, all this is designed to be nearly perfect for me. <laughs> it might not be nearly perfect for you. Uh, the height of the comb, the length of pull, uh, all that is, is, is there. So now the things that you can't see in the stock. Uh, we have got a bolt, uh, an all thread actually, that runs down, the, down into the grip from here. So we drilled a hole up here and put it down through the grip. It's uh, maybe a quarter inch or five sixteenths inch all thread rod that's glued in. And the whole idea is if, if you're in the bush and you fall or a tracker falls or something like that, something happens that you're falling on this gun, this is a place that a rifle always breaks. So you can't keep it from breaking, but you can certainly make it a lot stronger by putting a steel all thread rod down through here. So we've done that, you can't see it, but I'd like to know that a few thousand miles away from home that this gun's always gonna work for me. You can't see that it's pillar bedded, and what that means is that the action is setting on a couple of aluminum pillars, uh, and then the uh, the screw here in the, the front guard screw and the rear guard screw, are, those uh, are also setting on the pillars. So what we've got is metal on metal here. And when you tighten these screws up, they're always tight because they're tightened against metal. And that's gonna keep the gun more accurate over time. It's also glass bedded uh, all through the action area and all through the barrel area. And what the glass bedding does is keeps out some of the moisture that you would have uh, that would get in there. And then a, a, probably the most compelling thing, all stocks are gonna warp a little bit up here in the fore end if they're fairly thin. 
And so one of the last things we did is we routed that out, the bottom of the fore end, uh, just the full length of it, really. And um, uh, we laid in uh, a, a steel bar. So we glued the steel bar in the back. We were able to adjust it just a little bit down inside the pocket so that the barrel was perfectly centered because we'd had a little bit of warpage was the reason we were doing it. Uh, and then we filled the rest of that barrel channel and that went over that steel rod with epoxy. And we have then a gap between the barrel and the uh, stock that is uniform on both sides uh, and the confidence that no matter what happens to the weather, uh, that that, that fore end is not going to shift right or left and it's not going to shift up or down because of that big piece of steel rod buried in there. So that's the three things that are inside the stock that you can't see. Uh, the wrist support, the wrist reinforcement, um, the glass bedding, the pillar bedding, uh, and the, the steel rod up here that supports the fore end. Of course, you've got the magnum cross bolt. So the stock is a pretty complicated piece of equipment. There's lots and lots of work there to be done, but it's critically, critically important to be able to, to fire the lock in the barrel if you would. Now, of course, uh, for a rifle to be nearly perfect, it's, it obviously has to shoot well. So we blueprinted the action to make it shoot well, but this barrel is, a, is just a critical element to what you're gonna get in terms of performance. So this is a Schillen barrel. It's 375 H&H, &H, which is a caliber that in my opinion is nearly perfect for me. Um, you can see it's a 24 inch barrel. You can see we've got uh, uh, express sights on it. Uh, there's a hood on the front that you can fold down if you, if you just need to, to get it off the, the sight so you got a little bit more visibility. Uh, you can see we put the barrel band swivel on it here. This particular barrel was selected, uh, the, the contour of the barrel was selected based on how it, uh, the total weight we were looking for in the rifle and where we wanted the rifle to balance. So we didn't want a heavy, heavy barrel up there that would cause the rifle to just dip down like this. You're gonna carry it in your hand like this uh, or you're simply going to uh, uh, carry it over your shoulder, but you're looking for balance in a gun that feels good when you put it up. It's not too barrel heavy and it's not heavy back here. And so that's the reason this particular contour of shill and barrel was, uh, was chosen. And the sights then are set to be dead on at about 50 yards, uh, which is about as far as what we think we were shooting open sights. Uh, I've got the uh, scope adjusted probably for 200 yards. Uh, but what this means is you're really shooting dead on uh, out to 200 yards. Uh, with this scope, I have shot uh, elephant uh, when it's been on uh, one and a half power, like at 15 or 20 yards distance. Uh, and I've also shot uh, uh, zebra and uh, heart of beast and stuff like that at 325 yards. So it's a very, very flexible scope. You, I don't have a need to have a 10 power scope uh, shooting at 325 yards off of sticks on a, a, a large animal in Africa. So the, the, the barrel is a critical, critical, important element for accuracy and also for what the gun looks like and how the gun uh, is gonna handle uh, in the field. And so that's the last element here, lock, stock, and barrel. <laughs> Don't forget the barrel. This is the completed uh, nearly perfect safari rifle. And we started with a Remington 700 uh, ADL, the blind magazine gun in seven millimeter Remington Magnum. So we pulled, we pulled the action out of it. We did about 40 different things to it and we filmed them all. And you can see all those on MidwayUSA.com. <laughs>